Wars rarely come as a surprise to those in power. Almost without exception, the period leading up to a physical conflict is marked by economic warfare and strategic maneuvering. In public school, we aren't taught this side of history because public schools are run by the state, and the state has a vested interest in having a population that accepts official explanations without question. Right now, the groundwork is being laid for a war between the United States and a bloc of resistant nations. Among these nations are China, Russia, North Korea, Syria, and Iran. This lead-up has passed unnoticed by most of the population for two reasons. One, the mainstream media and the US government intentionally obscure the geopolitical context of the events unfolding right now. And two, this stage in the conflict is comprised of an array of proxy wars, which will have secondary consequences that can only be anticipated if one has a firm grasp on the strategic importance of the regions in question. Unfortunately, we live in a time when much of the public is incapable of even finding countries like Iran or Syria on a map. The reason that nations wishing to instigate a war make use of proxy wars and other forms of provocation rather than attacking directly is largely psychological. When a government wants to take its people to war, they need the public to be caught by surprise when the situation escalates. It is the shock of an unexpected attack that creates the climate needed for an outright war. And this is only possible when the lead up to the crisis passes undetected. In these past months, we've seen an escalation in the tensions between the United States and North Korea, largely driven by US-led sanctions and a series of military exercises conducted by the US and South Korean militaries. These drills, which have been labeled full eagle, simulated US nuclear strikes and rehearsed coordinated attacks on the North. This in itself was an escalation, but the tensions were further heightened by the signing of a new mutual defense treaty between the United States and South Korea that significantly lowers the threshold required for the US to militarily engage North Korea. North Korea poses no real threat to the US, but if Pyongyang can be lured into a fight, China will be directly affected. This is no trifling matter considering that China has a mutual defense agreement with North Korea and has enough nuclear weapons to make North America uninhabitable. This particular crisis with Korea is but one of many provocative measures that the US has taken against China in recent years. Others include plans which were released in the NDAA of 2013 to target Chinese military tunnels with nuclear weapons and a general policy of military encirclement in Southeast Asia. But why would the US pick a fight with China? Why would anyone in their right mind provoke a nuclear power like this? The answer to that question is the same answer you'll find when you look into the real causes of the wars in the Middle East, and that's currency. The dollar is the world reserve currency, but more importantly, oil is only sold in US dollars. This petrodollar arrangement has been enforced since the early 70s, and the United States has a track record of toppling any country that attempts to organize against it. The reason for this is simple. The only thing giving the dollar value is the artificial demand created by this monopoly. Once the petrodollar dies, the dollar dies. And when this happens, the world is going to be turned on its head overnight. The United States took down Iraq when it started selling its oil in euros, and it took down Libya when Gaddafi started organizing African countries to set up a gold-based currency called the dinar. These were militarily weak nations with no nuclear weapons. But now China is moving to attack the dollar, and this is a game changer. China, of course, is not announcing its attack as such. Its moves have been quiet and subtle, but the implications are clear. The most recent move came this past month when China and Australia announced that they were going to be moving off the dollar for their bilateral trade. In 2010, China and Russia made the same agreement, followed by China and Japan in 2011, and China and Iran have worked out an arrangement that allows them to bypass the dollar entirely by exchanging Chinese consumer goods for oil. To top it all off, the BRICS nations, which include Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, have just announced in March that they're going to launch a new global development bank which will compete with the IMF and the World Bank. Furthermore, China has been buying up massive quantities of gold and taking steps to internationalize the yuan, leading to speculation that they may be planning to transition to the gold standard. These moves have massive implications. China is chipping away at the dollar piece by piece, but the mainstream media isn't talking about it. The politicians aren't talking about it. And the reason is simple. If the public were to understand the petrodollar, they would understand that there is no war on terrorism. There's only a war for control of the world's financial system. All this talk we're seeing right now of a red line supposedly crossed in Syria is part of the same game. It's a proxy war to provoke Syria's closest ally, Iran. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall we had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked.
which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. Uh, one can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? <laughs> we can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, it, it's, this, this is not a, a either-or proposition. Of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. For more information regarding the history of the petrodollar and the war that we're being led into, please watch our mini documentary entitled The Road to World War III. If you'd like more content like this, please subscribe to this channel, Storm Clouds Gathering, on YouTube. For updates and bonus content, follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash stormcloudsgathering, on Twitter at Collapse Updates, and our website, stormcloudsgathering.com.